Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, folks, welcome to the next conversation with Karalia. Last time we spoke with Kim Summer, and it was such an alive, juicy conversation. Um, I had more people reach out and like voice voice message me about that conversation to just rave about how awesome they found it than any of the other conversations so far. So if you haven't yet watched that one, highly recommend. Uh, This week, I'm going to be talking to Rana, I think it's Hamida. I'm going to have to double check on the pronunciation of her last name. I just know it as Rana. Uh, She's amazing. I met her at a festival, of course. Uh, She is, amongst other things, an artist, and she's a singer, a musician, a DJ, a dancer, an artistic director. Uh, She is also a yin yoga and yoga nidra guide, and she came to New Zealand um, a little while ago, about five years ago, maybe a little bit longer now, um, as a refugee. Um, She was living in Syria with her family. Her family is actually from Palestine. Uh, Her father I think became a refugee from Palestine, possibly uh, in 1948. I'm not 100% sure I need to check all these details, but suffice to say that I like, oh my goodness, when Rana and I sat down and had some conversations at the festival, I was like, wow, I really want to dive deep in with you and talk about what it was like growing up in the Middle East, what it was like to come to Aotearoa as a refugee, what it feels like now. Um just so many things. So we're going to be diving into all of that very shortly. Also, just to say that I really want this podcast to be inclusive and diverse, but you may have noticed that it's been women, women, women lately. And not because I'm not attempting to get men on the show. I've reached out to a number of men that I would love to interview. They've all said yes. And then I send them the link so they can book the interviews and none of them have. And I followed up and they're like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. And they haven't booked. And I'm really curious about that because there's at least three that that's happened, three men. And so there's a little bit of a pattern. So who knows, maybe next time I'll actually have a man on the show. Um, But for now, you just have to settle for all women. All righty, let's find out what Rana and I had to say in this conversation. All righty, we are here right now with Rana Hamida. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, bless. So where are you from? Where are you in the world right now? Give us a little bit of like context. I am originally Palestinian. I was born in Syria. And then I lived my school years in the Emirates, Mm. like 11 years. And then I went back to Syria for university. That's when the war started, 2011. And then in 2013, we landed in New Zealand. Mm. And since then, I've been in New Zealand. Mm. Bits and pieces, traveling around, but Uh on base here. Does it feel like a home, like being here now? Mm-hmm. A home, for sure. Yeah. A, a place where, a, a for sure, like a massive, massive changes happened when I'm in New Zealand. So it was like the home where I explored deeper unfoldings Mm, mm, Mm. yeah because so you were at university when the war broke out in Syria and what were you studying at the time commerce and economics (laughs) 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 
Okay, so all right. How did <laughs> I you didn't enjoy it? I did enjoy it. You didn't you did enjoy I it? I did enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, and then when you came to New Zealand, did you finish that off or did you abandon it or what happened when you got to NZ? They didn't accept it. They didn't accept it. So before coming here, you know, you do all these paper preparation that you're going to a new country and you do this cross credits. So they like translate everything that you, you studied. Heaps of work went into translation and like um, just all the preparation of transferring to another place. And of course, like from, so what happened is from Syria, we had to go to Egypt before coming to New Zealand because um, we were waiting for our papers to be ready and be able to enter New Zealand. So we were in Egypt for some time. <clears throat> and while I was in Egypt, I didn't really want to just like wait for, it was like a waiting room for me, for us, you know. But I didn't really want to wait. So I just signed up to the university that of the area that I was living in. And I cross-credited everything to there so I can continue study while I'm waiting. And in Egypt, they were like, oh, yeah, great. We can do that. But there are this amount of papers, like good amount of papers that you did not study, that it's in our curriculum but it's mm -hmm. not where you studied. So you will need to study all of that in addition to this year's papers. And I was like, okay, let's just do it. So started studying double the curriculum. Like I was studying double the amount of papers that other people in the same um, year were studying. And finished that, got to the accreditation for that and all the translation for all of this stuff. And then I came here after a year studying there. So I had one year left to finish. And Oakland Genie here, they were like, nope, we don't, we will not, we need more information. And I was like, what more information that I can bring you from Syria right now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is your I university am, still standing? I am the, the surviving information. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how did that feel like having made it out of war-torn Syria you know I'm guessing you fled across the land to Egypt and then to have that happen with the university was it just one more thing or it was quite like uh, itchy mm. but I feel for me at that point it was So what happened is I got accepted as a graduate degree, uh, but they didn't accept me to finish my undergraduate. Uh -huh. And I was like, I don't want to go to graduate degree before finishing my undergraduate. <laughs> I want to finish that and know what's information in here before I go there. And then I decided, my egotistical self decided that I know everything about commerce and economy so let's just study another degree. <laughs> oh. Really? Okay. So I did. <laughs> so I didn't. I didn't finish it. I was like, okay, fine. So so for me, I think at that point it was the the intensity of the whole transition period and yeah. fleeing and coming back here. I mean coming back here. That's crazy mm. to say coming here whoa how that, have I been here before <laughs> wow thank you oh. Oh. I need that where's my person <laughs> I moved to this new room and in the house where I record music and the people that I'm living with they're just they're they're bringing that experience of having a family uh, and how can I like refrain the connection mm. or the communication skills and life with like family figure? It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. 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 Very, very yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because I definitely <laughs> want to go into that aspect as well. Let's just finish off our university story. So, what did you end up doing as a degree if you did something different? A bachelor of property. Uh huh. 
Great. Yeah. So commerce, market, property. There you go. Uh -huh. Yeah. But now what you're doing is you're an artist. I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what artists do, no? Like they, they just try different art projects. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these art projects are like, it's worth putting on hold or or even letting go of. Like, mm. you know, it's, I, I, like, I view personally, my personal view of life is that everything is an art project. It's everything is an art piece, whether you're working on property or whether you're working in the polit mm. politi politics or anything. It's either that you draw a shitty, not harmonious piece of art <laughs> or you're you're like you're balanced in in the way that you're balancing your colors you know it's like mm. if i'm able to balance my communication in a in a politics point of view then i might have a harmonious communication and and deals and partnerships with people and mm -hmm. that will create a harmonious life mm. and that is that that's what a piece of art it's the harmonious communication between the different elements and the different colors so yeah I tried I tried many things and until now I try a lot of things so yeah yeah I love that <laughs> life is art life is art yeah mm -hmm. ah so on the emotional level so when you were in Syria were you in the war zone like did you experience war itself or was it yeah 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 definitely I was one of the like I was in one of the um active spots yeah it was not as active as other places mm -hmm. you know so there there was kind of a, a scale of how active yeah a, an area was and Aleppo was one of um it was one of the red zones. It did have a lot of actions happening. But even within Aleppo, there are some places more active than others. You know, it's yeah. a very yeah, so it's very interesting because even living within the the heart of events, it was at that point very hard to get a grip of truth. Mm. because what you witness is what you hear but what you hear is much more like whoa dramatized and like even mm. the people that are living in the country itself they would reach like they would get these um, news and videos of something that is flaring up somewhere and like what they would show is as if world one micro cosmic but for us being in it, it's like, oh, there were like 10 or 15 people. Mm. It's not always the case, but because sometimes you would receive false information, how can how can I ever start believing any other information, you know? So it was a mm. bit distorting. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when someone like when someone lies to you over and over or dramatize everything it becomes a bit hard to distinguish what is true and what is not mm -hmm. what is the extent of the intensity of the situation mm. so yeah it was interesting in that way to navigate that yeah I mean you know one of the reasons I ask is like here in New Zealand we are so blessed that we have not had any experiences of war in you know well over a hundred years mm -hmm. um and it just seems so outside the field of experience that that could potentially happen. When you were living in Syria did, as uh, a young person, did you have a sense that it was coming or was it out of the blue? Was it out of your realm of experience? I feel like the state of how the system functions over there it what it, it had two sides so in one side it has always been the case that like living in syria don't speak about the government mm. it has always been the case you know mm -hmm. it's it's a very 
it's a very family owned business kind of thing hmm. <laughs> you know but at the same time you would see flourishing economy mm -hmm. uh, people are getting better in life circumstances the whole country economy was not dependent on any uh, debt so it was debt free as a country mm. And that is a very huge. strong. That's position. huge, yeah. That's huge, yeah. So, and Christians, Muslims, Jews, they're all living like it, it was not a religious governmental system. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it has been for years a very strong unit mm -hmm. together. So, you know, you have these two sides that mm. is like, oh, you can't talk about the government at all. Like, literally, don't. Because, <laughs> right. like, people would, would, would say that the walls have ears. That point is that don't talk about, about the government because if you do, you're, you're, no one knows where you are. Right. Yeah? So that so, was a part of your reality there. Yeah. yeah. That's, part of, that's part of it. It's like, just don't talk about that. Yeah. But then on the same side, it's like, oh, okay, but like the economy is great. Like, why would I even talk about them? Mm. Just because they are, they pass their rulership from one father to the son. It doesn't matter if that is, if, if the whole space that they are governing is flourishing and it's coming mm. nicely. Oh, why would I talk about them? So it's like, there, there is this conflict of like, but at the same time, I should be free to, to, to not complain, but to like express. Yeah, like to express if something I don't like in the government. Like it's it's both sides. So we have been living in that environment, but then at the same on the, on the same side, I can acknowledge from my side as well that I lived there as a child, and then I left for all my school years, yeah. and then I came back for university. So there is much more that someone else who have been living there for that amount of period would be able to express on how it was over there and mm -hmm. i'm sure that you know, our experiences do depend on our own perception and yeah not only our experiences but our parents experiences so even if like mm -hmm. a parent did exp experience something painful from someone we have that trauma later on that is like yeah. oh that so you know how, yeah. how how credible can we how credible factually can we take on someone's perspective yeah right that's the interesting <laughs> thing yeah it's all it's all perspective yeah. um because you, your your father was a refugee from palestine is that correct i i did, did some googling and found some articles about you i was like oh did you <laughs> yeah, yeah i did i did <laughs> yes Yes. Yeah. So he yeah. had that refugee experience already in his DNA as such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so then as someone who's born in Syria, but your father's born in, in Palestine, like how did you identify growing up? Or how do you identify now? Like that sense of what land is your land? Like how do you see it? <laughs> who am I? <laughs> yeah. Who are you and how do you know? <laughs> Has that been has that been a struggle to to figure that out, you know, or mm. yeah, mm. yeah. I feel like for my father, it definitely was a I feel like it was a re-traumatizing event. Yeah, especially that when he was a refugee from Palestine, first time with his family, he was two and a half years or something. Mm -hmm. So he does remember some things, but there are so much more underneath that yeah. plays there and plays out without us knowing. So for myself and who am I, I think it was quite confusing for a while before I was comfortable with the fact that 
I am beyond what I will be able to know in this lifetime. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, you know, there's been so much over the last few decades around identity. I mean, identity politics has become a big thing, of course. And I think it's a necessary layer in human development. But I do feel like, like you just said, you you recognize that what you are is is beyond those levels of identity as such. Mm. And I feel like that's where we are going, mm. um, is knowing ourselves as beyond. And all of us there, we're, 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 we're brothers and sisters together. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it's yeah. it's a very like we are we are very rooted in nationalism. Yeah. Where people like believe they are where they are from like they are where they are from and they are their name and they are their um their age and they are their gender. And it's like it's it's really beyond that. Like it's yeah. part of who I am. It's part yeah. of who I am. Sure. I mean I, I, I have something that I like did not necessarily or consciously neglect or push aside where I'm from. I think it was naturally just pushed as if like I was taking a break because I'm like, I don't understand all this shit. I just mm. don't understand what I need to do. And my family were very, are very conservative. I mean, they are less conservative than other people, of course, but they are conservative um, in a way that they... They, they had not much education in their life. So, and not saying that education makes you any better than anything. It's just the life experiences in different ways and being open to explore things in different ways and being open to other perceptions of life. It does, and does help with unfolding who you are and knowing yourself more and more. And they lived in a conservative society. So, they are in, in turn a bit conservative and I had not really experienced much of life when I was with them because mm. um, you were still living at home when you're in university yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so we have the thing is like in in a typical Middle Eastern ha- household as a girl, you do grow up in your family ho- house, home. And then at one point, you are in the marriage age and you get proposals. And then you say yes to whatever you feel like you want to do. And that also, that freedom of choice varies from one family to the other. Mm-hmm. But in general terms, we have the freedom to, to be like, no, I don't like it. So... And then you you're you're transferred into your <laughs> uh, your package and transferred into your um, mixed household. <laughs> I like it. So you go from the family household to the husband household. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting. You know, it's it always for me has been like it just feels like a property transfer. <laughs> yeah. And as much as I like someone giving me money. But like when we get married, so the husband is is like <laughs> is um obliged or one of his responsibility is giving mahar. And mahar is a lump sum of money or whatever they agree on mm-hmm. as families that they would give as a, an expression of commitment to to this person. And I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Give me, <laughs> give me what you got. I'm gonna go shopping with that. You know, I don't mind. But there is something in me that is like, it just seems like we're having a sale <laughs> by relationship, and I am the object being sold in this uh, aspect, and I am not sure <laughs> how I feel about that. Even though I really want your money. But I don't know how it feels, you know? Yeah. So would you actually receive some of the money or would it go to your family? All of the money. Oh, my ah. God. Oh my God. Uh-huh. 
Okay, well, that's, I mean, I mean, Matt, you know, it's a little bit better than it going to your family instead. Oh, I yeah, mean. Yeah. No, it comes it comes to the girl for her preparation to be uh-huh. a, a wife. Right. Hmm. So it, it, like, girls can spend it on shopping for herself, whatever she wants, really. Shopping, gold, um, home ab- appliances, whatever she chooses right. to spend this money right. on. You know, okay. some... Some smart women buy gold and save them because gold value stays. So they're just like saving yeah. <laughs> investments, right? I'm investing yeah. in the stock market, crypto. Let's go. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> let's get married. Oh, <laughs> but it's it's okay. a very interesting thing. Very very interesting. And 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 even these things, understanding of these things, my perceptions of them have changed over time. Like that break that I took from being with the culture, oh, that's where we were. That's how we got here. Is the break from the the culture unconsciously, yeah. like not consciously, but I just have had a break of it. And the more I'm unfolding and and getting to know myself more and through life, the more I get closer to where I come from. But it's not mm. in a way of identification of like, oh, I am Palestinian. And we have rights you know it's like not like that it's more Uh like oh I was born in Syria and I don't see things happening by accident you know I feel like there is a deeper um purpose not necessarily meaning the meaning I put it on it but I feel like there is a a deeper sense of why things happen Mm. or like can I find the why because if I don't we don't see the why there is no why it's it's so it's easy simple mm-hmm. but like can i see the why in i was born in a country with that with that way of thinking while i am not that mm. like i was completely not that from the get go without me being exposed to internet or exposed to any really different points of view like i was living in that culture so there was no way of me being um affected heavily yeah by other but you knew way. yeah that's really curious that's so yeah. curious there you are you're born in the country with that particular construct with that particular conditioning and you don't operate that way yeah <laughs> so, so there is there is real conflict within your within the self is like ah, oh, and i thought for so long that there was something wrong with me and um that yeah there there was something wrong with me just simply because I was like everything is functioning this way why um why do I think or why do why is there something for me is not sounding right yeah there's nothing that can affirm the way I'm like experiencing and you know I can feel for all these people that might in any part of the world or in whichever other experience be feeling the same that conflict like oh mm, uh. but then there is this desire of like blame because you don't know any better it's like oh it's my family but really like later in life you realize that they were doing the best they can with what they knew yeah you know and whatever that is yes we always have the free choice and the free will to venture and know other things and be Mm -hmm. open to learning and listening and all of these and communicating but even in a bigger perspective even all of these things that we do it's to the best of our ability yeah we only know what we know yeah Yeah. we don't know what we don't know exactly Um, yeah so exactly. when when you came to New Zealand then, so you're already a university student. Um, how old were you at the time? 20, 2019. Yeah. So and so you came with your family. So I'm guessing you arrived and you're still living with your family. What was it like experiencing the culture of New Zealand? Did you know much about the country before you got here? How did the culture of New Zealand feel? <laughs> <laughs> It was so great. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I can do whatever I want. 
but but no it, it was interesting it was there was i think the culture shock for me came like six years down the right line you know but at the beginning i was much more excited of the fact that you know i was able to talk with people about different things there was a completely different shift in um what are we talking about the the nature my ability to just walk around but it's also like it was an interesting period as well because I was at university or I was starting to like get into university and I was in a different country so it there was a transition within transition and like yes I was in university in Syria but really there is nothing over there like Syria was very small where we are that I couldn't like sneak out of the university I mean I did that but uh, <laughs> sneak out of the university and like go somewhere like drive away but here I had more freedom of like I could drive at some point I got my first $500 car um (laughs) and yes exactly so it was there was that sense of oh I always believed in hope and freedom and I knew it, it exists I knew it existed regardless of whether I experienced it or not I knew that love and hope and freedom, they all existed regardless of whether I had them in my life. But I knew they were there. They were mm. natural appearances. It was there. So when me coming here and just like witnessing them before I even like start diving into them, it was like quite an exciting thing. It's like, oh, it's, it's there. <laughs> I can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 and that that like that excitement kind of rode off and uh, until until I came here I was I started going to English school so I'm able to get my points to admit to university and until then I had my mother or my my father or my brother had to drop me like to walk me and drop me there and take me back there was still that I was not really gonna walk alone yet <laughs> right right yeah. yeah so there there was that protection still and you know there is like two two ways of facing or dealing with change of culture you're either open for it and like curiously explore it or you completely like, like shut and be like, no, everything is out to change me. And like, yeah. you know, and my family had some of that, had some mm-hmm. aspect of this. They were still open, but they, they are also quite like religiously anchored. And that that is still for them very important. Mm. I mean, <laughs> this is not a great product of that. <laughs> but, <laughs> But so I mean, how did you how did you navigate that like feeling like oh my god now I can be free because this culture is free and then also recognizing that your family was still re- religiously anchored as you put it and somewhat open but not completely open how did you what was that like for you feeling that contrast mm. very interesting it's very interesting. I've always been a gradual person. So even when I was living overseas, I would be, I had to obey things in a physical realm. So I have to wear a headscarf and, um, you know, not be out of the house. I can't go out with my friends or anything like that. But inside, I knew that I'm just doing this to keep peace. Mm. And I knew that I was doing this because I'm scared of Mm -hmm. disobeying. So there was this, um, you can say split personality fully. Like if you look at it from that perspective, it can totally be split. Like I know inside of me, but I'm not aligning my action to it because of Mm -hmm. fear. And that's the state that, I yeah, until now I can go into if I am under stress or anxiety or things like that so in here 
it was a little bit more that I was able to physically align, you know? I was a little bit less scared. Slowly, slowly, I was less and less fearful of what could happen, you know, over the overseas, there, especially in the Emirates, if you run away, there is like big possibility that the father can go to the police and they can look for you and right. bring you back to your family home, you know? Uh-huh. Right. So Even if you're already like 19, 20 years old or so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So there was this fear of like, no one really is going to stand by me if I'm, if I decided to express myself mm -hmm. or to take action. So in here, it was more like, oh, actually, I don't think they're going to do that. Like, I don't think they're going to go. And bring me back. <laughs> I think actually I have a woman refuge place where I can go to here as well. So there was this kind of a little bit of, of feeling secure in the physical sense. Right. That's yeah. big. That's really yeah. big. Yeah. 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 And that was, that was a big thing. And because I was gradual, I've always been a gradual person until now I can meet people several times before I start like opening and like, yeah, being like <laughs> grateful and stuff like that. So it's, I am that. It's just that it takes some time for me to unfold and feel that safety in, 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 in all sense, in most sense that I can. So in here, um, I'm like, I've always thought about running away. Like I've always, these things always came to me. It's like, oh no, I can't take it. Like it was very, it was very intense for me at points where I wanted to go out with friends, especially like before New Zealand. And I couldn't because all my friends would like go out and I had no permission to do that. So there was a lot of like, felt like missing of, of life. Mm. But in here, I was slowly like, okay, I want to run away. I want to run away. But for me, it was more important the fact that I would want my family to be to be happy. Like I wanted, I wanted them to be happy as much as I can. And I knew that me running out of the house is is a big thing. It would break yeah. their heart, especially yeah. my mother. It was like my mother is super like. She's super soft and, and, and nice and all of that. And there is an aspect of victimhood uh, pattern. So it's like, you can, I can, I felt that patience and trust and belief is my allies. Mm. And I don't, I don't need, I don't need to rush me going out and having the life that I'm dreaming about and I feel called to have before it's time. Mm. So there is the part of plan that is like, okay, now the best thing I can do is I can be here and to the best of my ability, be support and live with them. And when the time comes, I find a husband. <laughs> so you can go from one house to the other house. Yes, but the <laughs> but the, the 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 most important thing is that husband that I find is very important that I find the right one. Hmm. I find the man that is not going to control me. He's going to be understanding. He's going to be loving. He's going to be open. And then my patience and my weight and my uh, time with my family will be worthwhile. And everyone will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So that was that was your strategy. That's what you sort of yeah, planned out. Yeah, it was very, very strategic yeah and you're taking care of your family I love that too you, you know in your strategy you were caring about their experience and trying to balance up your mm. desires with their desires yeah. so what ac what actually happened well <laughs> well <laughs> you remember that 500 dollar car 
Uh huh. I do. <laughs> I was washing it without my headscarf. Oh no! Uh, in front of my my sister's house one time, and my father came to visit my sister while I'm washing it outside on the street, and then he saw me there without a headscarf, wearing a singlet, and uh, washing a car, like a. Mm. So. Yeah, it was a very interesting interaction, and I can't like I, it. It can it can never leave my my memory. You know, I was like they're like yeah, life is good. I like da, 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 da. and then <laughs> my father's car just like drives, and I'm like eye connection, <laughs> <laughs> and then he like turns around, and then pass by, and leaves. He doesn't even stop. He, does, he was coming to visit my sister and he just like comes in, he sees me, turns around, goes. And wow. I'm like, walk inside the house and I was like, Hiba, my sister. So this just happened. And she was like, oh, <laughs> shizzle. <laughs> <laughs> but we were like, okay, it's acting cool. Like nothing happened. I am, And I'm really good under pressure. Like uh -huh. really right. good under so I'll be calling you. Happens, I'm like super cool. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super cool. Like under pressure, you might see, look at me and be like, this person has huge trauma that in such situation, they are even more present and not flinching. Hmm. And I actually like, I, all my system gets really, really still. Hmm. It's like, this is the time where you're, you need to be still. It knows my system just knows it without me like trying to do it. But now that we're talking about like something like that or like a death or something like this, you know, that's when I'm just like, <sighs> then after that, I feel the effect of it. Yeah. But at that End point, it's like, Whoa. yeah. So I'm acting cool, all good. And then I went away, like, I just went for a visit to someone's house at that point I think I was doing a modeling session at that point I was doing modeling and circus and all these things no one knew about it I was it. gonna say did your parents know yeah. no no okay <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah it was funny it was, it was it was an adventure I my life is an adventure and at that point there was absolutely no other choice other than to just ride yeah the, the spur of inspiration and and curiosity mm -hmm. because otherwise I had no reasoning to why not now that I'm like free yeah. and anchored in my ability to do things like I'm now like at that point my thought was I am free from my family then I'm free that was for me the meaning of freedom, being free from the system of control. Yeah. That was represented by a physical people mm -hmm. or a country or a house or a room. But then, you know, after that, you get out and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm free. And then you decide there is multi layers to freedom. And we become freer and freer and freer but we're still in this physical realm yeah we're still we're still not free to some extent yeah. but there's yeah, always going to be those limitations so yeah. so what happened your father turned around I'm guessing it would have really can we use the word triggered like it, you know I imagine within his perspective of reality it would have brought up a lot of different strong feelings mm -hmm. and I'm totally imagining this but he may have taken the safer choice than just driving on by and not it might've been really challenging for him to speak to you in that moment. He might've been concerned about what might come out. Who mm -hmm. knows? I don't know. Uh, what happened? Like, when did you finally see him again? Or did, so you're off doing modeling? <laughs> did you just no, never? Well, well he, he did that. He left. And then we just acted cool. Like I acted cool mm -hmm. because since two or three years before coming here, when we were in the Emirates, he stopped talking to me because 
I called him backward. And then, and I think, I, I know it was triggering. Yeah. But it was true at that point. You know, mm. the situation that happened, it was intense. And, and I said that, and, you know, they're not prepared or have ever experienced a son or a daughter standing up and like saying something yeah um so yeah I know it was triggering so he stopped talking to me and that was like for almost 10 years we were almost strangers in the same house oh wow so that him was, turning around and driving on was was a continuation in some ways of the the non-communication that had been happening for 10 years yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then after that um I got a call while I was in this session away and um, I think it was my sister, it was my sister. And she said, um, so your father says, don't come back home. Mm. And I'm like, <sighs> <I'm> <laughs> it's horrible it's horrible it's just like you i was like wow it took a while <laughs> and it only took for me to embody what i was feeling yeah it only took for me to actually not be scared yeah to say or do something and it took a it took a long time that i was living in unconscious fear you know mm. just I was scared to the point that I would I didn't even know that I was scared yeah like I was not I didn't perceive myself to be scared I just perceived that I was just doing what anyone is doing right now yeah which is just obeying the current situation like I was just yeah. playing what I had and then after that, I was like, yeah, actually, I was scared. Like, I, I am scared a lot of times until now. Like, my life is crazy. But most of the time, I'm scared. Mm. But it's just that I keep doing it. Yeah, you lay down and show up. I learned to just do it, regardless of how scared I am. Mm. Because what's the worst that could happen? I could die? Sweet. Well great let's just do it might as well do it while I'm doing something that I am going into that fear I'm going to the unknown otherwise I'm just being stopped by it like I have been for years with my family you know mm. it's it's a very valuable experiential listen that I had with my family and I'm very grateful for that mm. I'm very grateful for them standing for what they believed was right yeah and no matter yeah. how hard that experience was for me them standing for what they believed it was right gave me the chance to go through this experience and learn experientially how to stand in what i believe is mm. true for me yeah mm. it's an indirect learning with my family i been very big like lately and really reflecting on that and like the way that my family taught me is indirect learning and this is how I I learned from from the universe like this is how I actually learn is yeah. that I don't learn when someone be like okay you do this you do that da, 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 da. no like whatever they taught me like this way I didn't necessarily learn and so it was more about I learned what not to do. Mm. I learned that I know that they are expressing their love, but now I know that I don't express love like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome to be able to understand that, that they are standing in their own power according to their perspective of reality and what feels right to them and they're doing it ultimately out of love for you because they love you mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 
yeah. yeah. So yeah, he kicked me out of the house and I was like, great, amazing. Let's go. <laughs> Life, here I come. Are you ready? <laughs> so yeah, the only thing that broke my heart really was the next day, my mother calling me and crying, being like, come back. Like, don't, yeah. don't leave me alone in here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is that that was main, the main thing, you know. I was I am the youngest, so my my sister getting married, my brothers leaving and like going to other countries and doing their own life because they are men and they can do that, um, of course. Uh, so I was left in, at home with my mom. So mm. I was like the 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 back fall for my mother, the shoulders that like she can come and be like, oh this happened this happened and your father did this or that's what he said or stuff like that you know so which is what you do in any like in any relationship with yeah. friends or anything so I was her friend in a way that she would come so that was what broke my heart most is that next day her calling me like come back and I'm like I love you but I want to come back you know it's just mm. it's it's very hard to navigate that but knowing at that point that like the universe guided me patiently to that point. And at that point, it was time to push me into a different place. Yeah. And I felt like surrendering to that. Just like I learned how to surrender to, to their rules at mm. one point. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with that. Mm. so yeah that was a big shift that was yeah. a huge shift and then life just took off whoa <laughs> so when did you go to your first festival when did you just have a <laughs> festival <laughs> uh, uh, when well the first like year i think it took like a year for me to go to clubs and town and family bar and like dancing crazy and then I met I met a friend through circus Mm because I was still doing circus at that point and then I met a friend through her that was coming there for whatever reason and he was like oh you should come to this festival that is coming on this time this day and that was that was that I went to this (laughs) uh, party it was a party actually it was not a festival but it was made by festival people festival production yeah um forgot what their names and then um Mm. that was the first time I tried psychedelics and that was that was that. That's when I started dancing. Yeah. Like really mm-hmm. dancing. Being danced. Being danced. Yeah. 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 That was that. <laughs> Here's to being danced. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then after that, I was just like, yeah. There was I was I was still like dipping in and out of the clubs and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when I went to the clubs, I did try alcohol for the first time. Mm-hmm. I did experience that uh, extent of where can I go and with that. And it, it was just not really mm. for me. So, yeah. yeah, like, I'm grateful to be able to experience it, to know that it's not what I wanted anyway. Is like, and I didn't grow up in a in a culture where they drink alcohol or anything. So it's haram. It's you don't drink it. So for me, like trying it and going into it, it's a yeah. it's also a big deep dive into like almost like why is it haram? Why why am I not allowed to drink it? Why? Mm. And then the you know, trying it. Yeah, yeah. Trying it and then you're like, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense now cool 
but you know like it, it's balance like it's the reasons behind why not to do some stuff in the religion in the, in the islamic religion is for specific reasons there are the reasons that's why mm. if the reasons don't exist if you are balanced in your experience of life and you are conscious of when something doesn't work for you you're not like dragged by by wanting to belong or to socialize or to um be in the circle or to numb things you're not using it to yeah other like to these reasons to completely like go off your mind and not not to be conscious of things then yeah the reason stands the haram stands but like haram what is haram it's like even a reformation of what is the meaning of that word it's like what is haram now i'm like oh really haram is it's really not fair for my own self mm. it's not like fair. honoring the self is it honoring yeah, the self in a way much but people t- started like taking things in so much different context and yeah. super literally that it started being super um revolting for people to follow because it's mm. like oh it's that and that it's like no you like you don't understand what is that and that's why you're being so rigid about how you're teaching this to people around you or to your children and stuff like that you need to understand what you are following Mm. to be able to teach it to other people or expect Mm. other people around you to even follow it Mm. so for me personally it was the experience the experiential um knowledge and dipping into the fear of like oh my god it's haram like i'm doing something haram that i've been brought up all my life that if i do it i go to hell yeah did you feel that conditioning in your body like was it did you did you ever felt sense of it being really strong when you went to drink alcohol for the first time i think i felt i felt a bit more like (sighs) (laughs) mischievous (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I'm gonna try I think this is what I felt the thing that I felt very much in my body like crunching and like to the point of fainting is the first time I put a tampon inside me ah because I was like if I put a tampon inside me I will lose my virginity and then I am fully like I'm never gonna get married only yeah. for some is like an a complete I'm not virgin. And so that I, one had sunk deeper. That conditioning was really strong. Yeah. Yeah, because that was my that was my escape to get married. Right. So if I can't do that, or if like they say, oh, she's not virgin when they get married, like it's a it's a scandal. So it's like, it's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. I think this one was more into my body, much, much more like, <gasps> because it was connected to my physical safety. Mm-hmm. And alcohol for me was not like, I don't think I've ever, I've, I've never even in my family house desired to try it, you know? Yeah. But for me being here, it was like, no, I like, I did, I actually tried it before coming here. I tried it in Egypt but (laughs) i won't tell that story but i did i did try try that but they in here they're having that ability to like experience this it was just like tried it six months in in i think and then it was like no not my thing not interested yeah i didn't like the the thing of it so when i went to festivals Mm -hmm. and experienced psychedelics it was a completely different um Thing. like it's something that we've never talked about it's never been talked about yes they talked about drugs in in my previous life but like they're not really it was not that you know it was not lsd yeah it was a completely different experience that opened my perception of reality yeah. in a whole new level mm. you know mm-hmm. oh, i know <laughs> of course you do <laughs> you're writing a book about it <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, so 
So I'm yeah. curious, like in festivals, did you feel at home? Did you feel like you'd come home to yourself or to a place or like what would, what was it like for you? I feel coming home to myself represent that. Mm. Mm. There was this feeling of real freedom that I felt. That was a combination of exploring with psychedelics the music mm -hmm. so i was more into psychedelics that's where that's where i started i started with psytrance psychedelic trance music yeah and that experience of of being energy and not being not being the body mm -hmm. you know the experience of of closing my eyes and just being in full like crazy dance uh-huh what full stillness inside yeah is that that nothingness uh -huh. that, that like and that was for me real freedom. Mm. Excuse me. <laughs> oh. That was for me real freedom. And yes, I met amazing people and had amazing conversations and experienced myself in a completely different way. Mm. But it's really mainly that feeling of like, Mm. Mm. yeah 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 mm. hmm. so before we wrap up I'd love to know like how you perceive religion or spirituality for yourself now what is it that you follow or honor or you know how do you do you pray how do you pray do you have ritual ceremony do you follow any of the festivals like yeah so I'm mm. curious about I follow inner guidance and balance I feel like our differences is what bring us together. Mm. It's not our similarities. It's the fact that we are different mm. is what make us one. And I believe in oneness. Mm. I believe that everything is one. It is the that point, but then also it's it's a spiral. I studied yoga. I've felt connected to Buddhism. I've witnessed and been part of. Hindu celebrations and I've been part of Muslim culture. I feel very drawn to churches and mosques. They're so m magnificent and beautiful. And I also can see that there is nothing for sure. Mm. Yeah. But through all of them, through all the different perspectives of what is there, there is a point 
where you can sit and accept all of that as part of it, as all like different facets of the same unlimited facets diamond mm. that keeps reflecting everything in so many different ways. in so many different forms and it's unfair for me to identify it as one thing only mm. because I believe in an infinite infinite one mm. And that we're part of that. Mm -hmm. And that connects to all the stories of creation as well. I mean, yeah. the breath breath of life. We are the breath, the, the outcome of a breath of life. Or we are the breath of life at the same time. And we also can, in another layer and dimension of reality, we can be the breather of mm. the breath of life. Uh -huh. And we can be the one that is observing the breath that we are all of that in different timelines. Mm. And there's, on a bigger perspective, all these timelines are one. Mm -hmm. But in this physical reality, I am experiencing one of these timelines or more. And I just believe we are part of it. We are it, but we are part of it. Yeah. You know, more mm -hmm. like part of it in this physical, physical comprehension of it. Because we are we are limited in this physical reality to how much we can comprehend things. Yeah. That's why I said that I, I follow my inner guidance because there are things that I cannot comprehend, but I know. Yeah. And there's always that facility of discrimination to be able to to mm -hmm. see when I am like okay I am guided and I can see that and I can still discern and I feel like this is for me what spirituality is continuing to to feel and live life and completely live it but at the same time see it see myself doing that and be very radically honest about when it's when it's aligned, when it's true, when it's real reflection of the breath of life, mm. and when it's out of that alignment. Mm. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's out of that alignment. Mm. And that's okay if I'm honest with myself. Yes, I am being out of alignment. Mm. Not being like, oh, yes. Mm, uh, like no i'm not you know it's it's just being radically honest and it's very hard to see the truth sometimes yeah and that's why i feel it, it it's almost the reason of conflict in most of the inner world and outer world yeah. it's it's just hard to acknowledge and see the truth sometimes yeah but we, we have, have to, to do that. that yeah yeah we have to do it. There's no other way and yeah. whether whether we like it or not truth will shine its its light and it's either it blinds us because we're trying really hard to not um not see it but once you see it it just it becomes a bit tough to and when i say see it it's not like oh i see the truth it's more like it's a continuous unfolding of, of yeah. what that means really in the day to day so it's that I feel like I am, I am devoted to mm. a spiritual path of continuing to see and learn and study myself through mm. this body. Mm. Um, rituals, it's breath. I I breathe. Breathing yeah. is my method of of connecting and bridging. Um, my physical with my mental and my emotional and spiritual um, it's the simplest thing yet it is for me the main practice that I do uh, follow I 
I sing mm. and it's also part of my practice. Mm -hmm. I dance. Yeah. And it is part of my practice. Um, I feel like being in a spiritual, devotional journey, it's out to turn the world into a temple. Yes. Uh, it's it just it just happened. Yes. It just yeah, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't Thanks. not yeah. Sanctification. Yeah. That's the word. Sanctification. Sanctifying oh. everything. Oh my god. I, like, I love this word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it might be the name of my festival book is sanctification. Like that's the working title right now. It's like, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. We're sanctifying life. This is our temple. This is our temple. This is our temple. Yeah. 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 Oh. And what a pleasure to be worshiping and in devotion and dancing in this life, yeah, alongside amazing people. Mm. And it's very, it's it's an amazing pleasure to meet you. And mm. I know that time where we connected in Shiva Shakti and you like yeah. sat in that couch. It was really the first time we really like, yeah, dropped, dropped in. in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and yeah it's it's really amazing it's this kind of connections that you know that gradual unfolding it gets to a point where it's like <laughs> hmm. like oh and you know you know this is not the end of the unfolding but life will continue to unfold and there are always going to be these moments where you're just like oh yeah thank yeah. you for whatever like sometimes we look up there and we like thank you because of our conditioning that there is a god up there but it's really not like it's, it's just thank you everywhere everywhere oh, down. Oh. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you you're in this tip, the tip of the finger that's here you know okay. it's that and it's, it's a big thing to mm -hmm. be like one of my biggest realization is like because i've been djing for for a long time yeah. and there was a part of me that is like oh don't forget don't forget what's your real work. Mm. It's not that. This is a tool. Yeah. Like being a DJ or being a dancer or a teacher. In one, it's a tool in that exploration and unfolding work that I'm doing here. So don't be attached to that. So if, if, you're, if you feel like the breath of life is, is flowing you into a different space, like be with it. Because, yeah, don't be, don't forget, don't forget. Yeah. Like, it's like someone sent me this thing, like someone was pointing at the moon and was reminding that, remember, that the moon is what we're looking at, it's not your finger. Yeah. Finger is what's pointing. Yeah. And that could change. You can point with anything else. So yeah, this is this is my practices. My practices is just breathing and through whatever happens, even my laundry, uh, laundry or like doing this and this is yes. just present. Um, and that continuous practice of bringing myself back to present and not be living in 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 the past. Be aware of the past that is playing out right now. Be aware of the future worries that are playing out right now. But be here and choose yeah. from that space. Yeah. Because that choice is what is going to manifest slowly. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. I think yeah. that's what I noticed about our interactions is how present you were. And it just was such a delight because I felt like, like I had this um, sense that we are energy natives. You know, what we are is energy. And those people that are more embodied in that, I feel like when I meet someone who's an energy native, the energy bodies just I feel like I just know people even though I don't know them at all there's a sense of like oh I know I can sense I can feel it's like energy meets energy yeah <laughs> I'm like that's another version of me yeah <laughs> oh it's it's amazing it's amazing that uh, meeting people with that curiosity and openness is just yeah. very uh, refreshing refreshing yeah and it's a continuous oh, unfolding for myself yeah so mm. thank you for being a person a reflection a 
energetic field that I'm able to see uh, a reflection clearly and mm. beautifully drop into that space wow. of curious exploration and conversation and bouncing over each other. So, yeah. 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 Oh, please, please, right back at you, right back at you. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show and being so generous and sharing your journey over the last 10, 15 years or so. I know so many people are going to, I think it's going to resonate with a lot of people. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> So that was Arana Hamada, H-A-M-I-D-A. -A. Wow, I just feel I just feel so touched. It was so beautiful to just hear Arana's story, for her to share so generously of some delicate territory. Um, you know, it's interesting being I'm I'm not really in the role of a journalist here, and I've always been a little bit shy about asking probing questions, you could say. And so I'm balancing here curiosity and a desire to invite people to open up and share around things. And also that sense of like, well, what's too much or what's invasive? What's a violation of privacy? Um, you know, so asking about things such as, you know, Syria and what's, what it was like in Syria and recognizing that there can be trauma there and people don't necessarily want to talk about what they might have experienced, et cetera. And like I said, here in New Zealand, it, it hasn't been part of my live reality. It's, it's just not something that we even imagine would necessarily happen. Um, but, it, you know, all things can happen to all people at all times. And I feel like acknowledging that, you know, we hear about things like the, the war in Syria, we can often other that the people that are experiencing that as if they're different from us. And they're not. They're families too, living in suburbs, going about their daily life, and all of a sudden, the suburbs being bombed, or or there's you know snipers on the street, or people are going door to door hunting down other people. And I think one of the things about conversations with Carolia is I'm willing to open up my heart space and to feel the truth of other people's experiences because I feel that. When we're willing to do that, when we're willing to open up and allow other people's pain, sometimes trauma, into our hearts, I feel like it halves it for everybody involved, you know. And the more willing that we are to meet our own pain, the more capable and more capacity we have to meet other people's pain. I just think the way we experience reality would change a lot. Um, or it is for me it's changed a lot the more that I'm able to do that the more I'm able to sit with people and to feel things and I just love the playful the playfulness of that conversation as well as we explored identity and you know coming to New Zealand being a refugee trying to deal with bureaucracy and the fact that you know Auckland University didn't recognize the Syrian University or even the Egyptian University um, and I, you know the little part of me is like I wonder if they would have recognized like Oxford University and you know are there cultural biases there like what's going on um yeah so that was another conversation with Carolia as I mentioned at the very beginning for whatever reason the men are not booking sessions it's, it's all the women at the moment um if you know of someone that you would love to see on conversations with Carolia please do feel free to recommend someone you can just send me an email um, or a message. Instagram is the best place to um, message me quite quickly. And if you yourself would love to be on the show, you know, don't be shy. Put yourself forward and just, you know, include a couple of sentences about why you feel you'd make for a good guest on conversations. Um, all righty. Hmm. Just inviting you to take a moment to take a breath to really notice what the breath feels like in your nostrils. To allow that breath to fill up your heart space, really tune into your heart and just feel into whatever might be present in your heart space.
recognizing that we are all ultimately connected through our hearts, through the field, through the oneness. Even as we are all completely different, we're all diverse, like multiple, it's like a multiplicity of diversity, you could say. But at the core, underneath it all, there's the oneness. All right, big love to you all. Have an amazing, amazing day wherever you are, whatever it is that you are doing. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia. And trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.